Yeah. Um, okay, so hello. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the project we had recently, with, uh, which was induced by the industry, um, and which forced us to uh, get friends with Lustre, with Rocky, and uh, try to run it on a slightly longer distance than you usually see in the data centers. Um, so just a few words about Cypronet. Uh, we are one of five Polish national supercomputing centers, actually the biggest in terms of resources. Uh, we've been on the market, if you can call it the market, for over 45 years now. Um, we are located in Krakow in Poland, um, around 160 staff, so like mid-size center. Um, we do quite a lot of activities in the networking, so we connect all of the universities and municipal institutions, some of the public institutions in Krakow, to the network, through Jant, uh, to other um, to other infrastructures. Um, so we have over 40 locations in the city, uh, quite a good connectivity to the outside. Um, so this is one of our activities. The other one is obviously HPC and supercomputing. Um, currently, we operate two big systems, Zeus and Prometheus. Prometheus, I guess it's 174 the, from, on the today uh, top 500 list. Um, so it's it's actually dropping quite uh, quite fast. Just four years back, it was 38. Um, we have around 50 petabytes of storage for the academic uh, usage. Um, we do quite a lot of international projects, national projects. So basically, a very very regular HPC center. Um, but the project I'm going to talk about is not that usual. Um, so just a few words about uh, our systems. We are quite an interdisciplinary center. We have quite wide area of users, over 6,000 users, um, over 900 different software modules installed. We support most of them. Uh, so our workload is rather partitions. You can see the stats for the biggest jobs in la last year, so it's not a full machine run, but it's still, still pretty beefy if you, if you look at the number of, um, of users. Um, we are doing more or less 400 computational projects a year, uh, so that, that's, uh, that's more or less our, our activity. Um, the system we currently operate on uh, operate is Prometheus. This is a warm, water-cooled HP Apollo 8000 dinosaur, which died pretty soon after it was born, um, thanks to the SGI acquisition. Um, it, it runs on Intel Xeon uh, CPUs, so regular Haswell 50,000 cores, uh, and then some small amount of, of NVIDIA GPUs. Um, on the storage part, which I think is it's, it's more interesting uh, in, in this audience, uh, we run on DDN. The, these are SFA 12Ks. We have two file systems, both five petabytes. Our scratch file system was sized, sized for 120 gigabytes per second. And the uh, archive, which is not really a great name, it's, it's re really a project space, um, is, is sized at 60 gigabytes per second. Uh, it's actually quite efficient in terms of power. We've been quite high on the Green 500 at least while, this, while the system was uh, commissioned. So yeah, that's that's the infrastructure. Um, so some time ago, we were reached by um, by an industrial uh, partner, by a company, who was looking to build a, to build an infrastructure or to have an infrastructure for storing and processing data, data for an autonomous driving project. So the car you might see on the far right, uh, <laughs> it's not actually the one they are working on. Uh, this is a Polish Fiat 176P, and it would be really great if, if they could be autonomous because I guess I couldn't fit inside. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just to, to emphasize the automotive part of the whole presentation. So this is the only funny picture in the presentation. Um, so the, the project was kind of interesting. So we, we started talking about basically them using our infrastructure. Uh, we, we had a POC in 2017 to understand the performance uh, expectations, to understand the I/O patterns, <clears throat> to understand also the HPC part of the whole uh, project. Uh, and in the end, it evolved to being more or less a separate infrastructure, uh, which I will describe in a in, in few moments. But besides of just data storage, which was, you know, it was supposed to be POSIX, it was supposed to be really big, it was supposed to grow in time. So 
especially the growth, it's, it's not something which file systems like a lot. Um, there's also the HPC part or the data analysis part, if you prefer. There's some networking. Um, there's some consulting, obviously, how to make it all work, how to glue it, um, and how to, how to keep it, keep it efficient. So as I mentioned, we had the POC in 2017, then most 2018 um, was spent in uh, legal departments, and also a lot of tests and infrastructure design. Uh, we had different ideas, how should we make it work, um, so that's also something which, which I will mention in, in a few moments. And we went into production Q1 this year, so it seems to work a bit. Um, so. There are a few issues how to actually make a system like this, a project like this work in an academic environment. So traditionally, the academic and the industrial users have slightly different requirements in terms of data privacy of, of in, 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 the, in the field of separation of workloads. Um, so especially for storage, of course, we wanted to have a separate a uh, separate solution, solution not only to preserve security, but also to isolate uh, performance domains so we wouldn't cross each other. Um, now, traditionally, supercomputers or, or even compute clusters are not really great in multi-tenancy. So if you want to, to isolate the traffic, you need to spend some time on, on understanding how actually do it efficiently. Um, so in the end, we decided to go with a dedicated IB partition on the system and uh, kind of glue it with our scheduling system. Uh, we decided to go with a dedicated OS image, which we can control in a slightly different way than we control the academic user um, image, which is most, more dynamic, more, uh, more often updated. Um, we also needed to play a bit with Slurm, so we needed to make sure that both sides wouldn't see what the other side is doing, that they wouldn't be able to cross the boundary of, uh, of job submission. Um, and what's actually the hardest part is how to make sure that the system which was funded for the academic user community won't be used just for industry and, and that we won't allow uh, the academic users to use the industrial resources. So. Um, that's actually, it, it's been quite challenging, and this is not really touching the storage part at all yet. Um, then when we go to storage, our initial idea uh, was to go with ZFS JBots. Mostly we were inspired by Steven Sims' talks uh, many times here, but not only. Um, so we still think that it would be... A, good way to go. Um, we, we had some discussions with DDN how to support it. In the end, we ended up uh, going in the secure way, in the, in the safe way, so for regular write systems. Um, but actually, we got some quite a lot of experience in, in, in ZFS and JBots. 2018, I think it was not the best year for ZFS. And last year, there were some, some issues. There were some bugs. Uh, there was also the, the Intel team acquisition by DDN, so it all kind of built up into the atmosphere that uh, you know changed our mind. Um, in terms of uh, the fabric, that was also quite challenging because we are used to InfiniBand. We run it uh, on our on all of our systems. However, because of the thing which I will mention in a few moments, InfiniBand was not really a great choice. Um, so we were thinking maybe we should go with, with Ethernet. Um, actually, in terms of the hardware, it's quite similar on the NIC side. Uh, in terms of Lustre, if you run RDMA, it's actually the same driver, so it should be uh, pretty straightforward. Um, what was also like the out outcome of the POC was the capacity performance ratio. So as you will see, the system is not really extremely performant in, in, I mean, in this in this room, I guess. It's quite performant for, for a regular IT guy. Um, but what we needed to focus uh, was capacity and, and price, price performance. Um, and then if, you build, if you're building a multi-petabyte file system, you should really consider whether you really need one namespace for all of it. Maybe it's, it's better to partition it just in case. I mean, it's not that Lustre loses data, it doesn't, but you know, things might go wrong, and in this case it's better to have a um, smaller failure domain. So the issue we had is that uh, our main HPC system, so Prometheus is located in our primary data center in Navoiki, uh, in Navoiki so in, in the place where we have our offices. 
Um, but we wanted to locate the hardware in the remote location, which, um, I mean, for future reasons, it's, it's better to, to put the, the equipment there. Um, so the distance, like the physical short path, I think it's around eight kilometers uh, on fiber, on the short, short, uh, short path of dark fiber, which we have, it's 14 kilometers, 14 point something. And we also have a few backup links, which is our regular municipal area network uh, traffic. So, I mean, this is not the dream for Lustre, for RDMA. This looks slightly better, but still it, it's not that easy to just make it work. Um, the latency of, uh, of the link is 81 microseconds, so it's not really spectacular, but it's quite far from what we're used to in, in the closely tuple, coupled uh, storage system. I, I could have drawn this, but it would take some time. But um, what I want to show here is um, the way we, we did lay out the infrastructure in the end. So this is the part located in our remote location. This is the part located in our primary uh, facility. So this is the, the supercomputer which we are using for, uh, for jobs. We are routing the LNet. So all, all the red um, lines are Ethernet. The blue lines are InfiniBand FDR. So we are using LNet routers to, to route the Ethernet traffic to the system. So this is some, somehow quite the opposite of what, what you would do in, in the, the regular way. So. You might have uh, storage based on InfiniBand and routed to Ethernet for some you know, cloud-like usage, so we're doing the opposite. Um, the main links here connecting the remote locations, these are our dark fiber links. Currently, we are using 12 of them, I think. Um, so these are 1,200 gigi links. We can upgrade them for 200 gigi. We could add some more in, in the future. So as for now, we think that the performance for, for the remote location is fine. As the backup, we are using the the MAN link. Uh, so actually, now if, you're, if you start to think about it, this is not really a usual word case, use case because this path is way different than this one. Uh, so you need to have a mechanism to handle the traffic, um, the traffic switch. Um, storage is connected to two redundant big switches. So these are Juniper QFX 10K director grade switches, quite redundant, quite... Uh, quite um, Stable, I'd say. Um, we have some access access switches. We have some additional infrastructure in the main data center, which also challenges the storage system. But this is something you know you you need to sign an NDA with the company. I didn't mention, so I'm not really uh, I'm not really going into into details here. Um, we were actually considering not to have this link, just to have two separate fabrics. It's not that easy for various reasons, but that's. That's something we can discuss over beer. Um, so in the end, we ended up with... Uh, so th this is the, the solution which we have now, and we would just either scale it by adding building blocks or by adding more like file systems like this, depending on where the workload and where the size, go size goes. For MDT, we are using just a regular SFA uh, array with some with some NVMe drives inside. Um, and for the main building block for the OST part, we are using Exascaler enabled SFA 7990. Um, it has so each building blocks ha each building block has over four ppbytes of usable space. It provides more or less 20 gigabytes per second of performance. So these are just 450, 14 terabyte drives, Ethernet enabled, embedded exascaler units. Um, yeah, I've mentioned the switches. So actually, we decided to go with the big switches also because they have deep buffers, so they could store up to 100 milliseconds of traffic. Uh, during tests, it seemed to be quite important to be able to handle this in case some things go, go really wrong. Um, but what was also nice is that they, they are actually quite feature rich, so we can do crazy stuff with the traffic. Um, and racks. Actually, that should be a separate slide, but um, these uh, units are really nice. They are really dense, and we cared about density, as you might see. So we have 900 drives per rack, which gives you like 2.5 petabytes of raw space per rack. There are a few more racks on the left. Um, and uh, the issue is that these units are actually very, very deep. So if you want to put them in a regular rack and still be able to you know, pull some cables, 
That's actually quite challenging. You can do it. Uh, DDN was very useful, actually, by providing as a unit before the, 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 the production phase started. So we were able to fit a rack, which, which, uh, which is good enough. Uh, we needed to make sure that both it wouldn't collapse because of the weight, and it would be able to close. You would be able to close the doors in the back. So we decided to order a custom 130 centimeters rack, um, and they are pretty fine. I, mean, I, I could recommend them, but just please remember to order them, order them six months before you start production. Um, and don't trust whatever the sales guy is, is telling you. So it's like, you could, I mean, if you know how to combine metal, you can do it in your garage, but very not really. Um, so now the, the rocky part. So how good am I on time? I need to run, yeah? Okay? So rocky, if you're not aware with what rocky is, just very shortly, this is RDMA over converge. At Ethernet, you have two different versions. You have the one which is running on uh, the Ethernet layer, which is non-routable. This is just one seg You need to keep, uh, keep it into, uh, in, in one segment of Ethernet network. You have the version 2, which runs on L3, so it uses UDP encapsulation. Uh, what's cool is you can route it, so you can run it pretty much all the networks you want. Uh, and the Melanox adapters, which are quite common in our world, uh, have uh, hardware support for, for the offload. So if you just take the, take the NICs, um, so th this is a configuration um, host switch, long distance switch host. So we are running through, through a switch network here. Uh, if you just run it through the through the long link, uh, you can actually see the performance drop. So the TCP local and TCP remote versions are running more or less on the same speed. So this is 2.5 gigabytes per second. But if you look at Rocky versions, then you can actually locally you can easily saturate the 100 gig link remotely. You need to play with it a bit. But just look, like out of the box performance, you might see that the difference is noticeable and it's actually quite. Uh, quite significant. What you cannot see on this graph is also the CPU load on the system, which is way lower if you're using Rocky. So the peak for this network was like 12, 25, 0 megabytes per second. We were able to get uh, just out of the box something around 11 gigabytes per second. So, so pretty nice. Um, so if uh, you fine-tune the long-range test, you can easily get into 97% of saturation, you can go slightly beyond, and I'm talking LNET self-test uh, uh, benchmark, so it's not a you know, synthetic Cooper for whatever RDMA benchmark, it's already running LNET. Um, so, now, the problem you have with, uh, with networks today, especially the ones which, which need to carry quite a lot of traffic, is that you know, they might be congested, congested, and you need to make something with it. Um, and actually, Ukar, so our, our team member, spent quite a lot of time testing different methods of handling congestion in Internet, so PFC, regular pause frames, uh, ECN. In the end, ECN was something which seems to work the best. Uh, so basically, you can run RDMA V2 over everything. You can route it, as I said. Uh, but the problem is that once you have packet drops, which might be caused by either congestion or different conditions, you will have transmission, retransmissions, so your traffic will look like a saw. And this is something which you really want to avoid. So, so ECN, which I will show a bit later, mitigates this pretty well. Um, the issue is that, the, that ECN needs to be enabled on the whole path. So most likely you need to control the path on your own. So if you're building your own infrastructure, that's going to work. If you're using some external providers, it might be an issue. Um, and basically how the, how the ECN works is that if, if there's a congestion, uh, the congestion notification protocol packet is sent back to the, to the sender, which is saying, hey, slow down, I'm congested. And it's, it's, it's being done through the whole path. So compared to the regular congestion uh, protocols, which just you know, take care about one single part of the path, this is the whole, the whole path. Uh, so you just need to have ECN-capable switches. Most of the more th modern switches, uh, fast switches, have this, but not all of them, just make sure it is. Enabled, you need to have adapters which support it. So all Menox, CX4, CX5, we have tested work fine. Um, 
with, uh, with Rocky, of course. Uh, and now the tricky part is that you need to flag the traffic. So we need to say, you need to differentiate the, the packets which are responsible for the slowdown uh, trigger from the main production uh, traffic. Because if you just over congest, congest the path, then you won't be able to send anything back because it's congested, right? So you can do it either by CMA Rocky Toss. Actually, we, are, so we have some discussions with, uh, with DDN how to make it also enable, how to enable this feature also in LNET because you could, you could set the flag in, in LNET. Um, you just enable ECN, you pri prioritize the congestion notification protocol packets so they always will be able to reach the, the sender in case the congestion happens. Um, yeah, and you just enjoy. Optionally, you can use backup links. So the, you can see the effects of enabling ECN here. Um, the, the blue one is uh, regular, rocky, uh, with no, con no flow control. The red one is TCP with no flow control. And the yellow one is Rocky with enabled uh, ECN. Um, it's a congested link, so we just enforce the congestion by putting too much traffic to the to the network. Actually, if you look at the link saturation, it's not uh, it's not great. So some things might be done to to improve this. And uh, in the production, we actually have improved it. But these are the this is the snapshot we had. So you can even better see how ECN works and how a congested ne network behaves if you just disable ECN at some point. So this is you know, regular, synthetic, RDMA traffic. I think it was even LNET traffic already, uh, which works pretty, pretty well. You just add more, you just add more to congest the, net, congest the network, and you can see that ECN is handling this pretty well. If you disable it, then you end up with, with this. So you don't want to see something like this. You don't want to rely on, on such a network. Uh, of course, the issue is that 14 kilometers might be good for bandwidth. You are able to hide the latency, um, which is there, as I said, 80 microseconds. This is not you know, critical, but for high latency sensitivity workloads, you, you, you will see some issues. So for bandwidth, these are two SFA systems on, on, the, other, on the other end, uh, which were not tuned to their max yet at that time. So we can actually get closer to 40 here. Um, these days, but if you just try like a very basic benchmark, so if you try to unpack the Linux kernel with one process, you will actually not see that the difference in in, uh, in execution time is quite significant. Of course, if you run many of them, you will hide this, but still, you need to be aware that the latency matters. I mean, it's like, obvious. Um, yeah, but for bandwidth, it's fine. Uh, if you need to run Rocky, just use ECN or you know, if anything else seems to be in place, you can you can also try. But our experience shows that ECN is, is the best one. Um, what what's also cool is that actually you can quite efficiently aggregate links in Ethernet. It was quite common in InfiniBand networks where you just plug the cables wherever and, and OpenSM handles the the traffic, the routing tables. Um, in in Ethernet, you need to do it quite differently. But still, if you if you use slats with ALB or ECMP for L3. Whatever it means, uh, then you know the the bandwidth just scales linearly, and you can you can push as as many of it as, as you want. Um, yeah, and Rocky actually is quite flexible. So we were considering InfiniBand. Uh, if you want to run InfiniBand over long distance or mid distance, you need to buy these Metro X switches from Melanox, which are both expensive, and they, I think they support 40 gig FDR at this point, so QDR speeds. Uh, so we were th we were considering one terabit per second as the minimum value for the first phase. So if you actually make the math, it's it's you know quite expensive and and still you're downsizing your your performance from 100 to 40 gig because you know, there, there's just no no other solution. Uh, but actually with Ethernet, we are just so the the path is 14.5 kilometers. We are using good quality 10 kilometers you know, optic modules and they work just fine. There's no loss. We've tried overheating them. We've tried doing bad stuff to them, and and they are very very stable, um, and they are cheap. I mean, hundred gigi fiber modules are really, really cheap compared to what you need to do to to have the same functionality in InfiniBand, and also you can do these you know backups um, by different paths. We are using BGP, I think now for routing, so it's just very very efficient. Yeah, so thanks for all the engaged parties. First of all, of course, DDN. Uh, 
uh, Melanox, Juniper for providing network park part, and, and Vasco, which is our local integrator, which uh, you know, shipped all the units to us and provided some support. Um, I invite you to, to see our booth on, on ISC. You will have the unique opportunity to taste some Krufkas. Uh, if you don't know what a Krufka is, then that's the booth number you, you're looking for. Um, it's actually quite close to both registration and food and drinks. So that's uh, just, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you.